you, you eat some glucose that goes into the body and your liver puts at least as much on top. That's why you have high blood glucose. I'm here again with Gabor Ordosi, Master of uh, Molecular Biology and also an MBA, I believe. Yeah, both are pretty formal, so I don't use uh, any of those uh, much in my uh, profession and even in my uh, scientific interest. So, uh, yeah, it, it gives me some basic understanding, but uh, I had to work up myself from, from the basics. I, I went back and read everything from starting from the 50s, basically. Right, and, and I'm well aware of the thousands of papers because you've sent me many of them. Uh, I was quite similar with the biochemical engineering. It was very useful as I went on the journey, but you've got to use your technical kind of ability and, and all your other skills to, to research these things. So you set up the Lower Insulin Facebook group, which is a fantastic place to understand all of the metabolic mechanisms of insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and where most chronic disease comes from. So we might talk now about some of those detailed mechanisms because they're truly fascinating. And maybe, uh, I think your own suggestion was to start where you started in your research, looking at the liver and the insulin and, and glucose, but then working through over the years as you got right to the root of the problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I've, I've never told this story openly, at least publicly, but uh, it all started with a regular weight loss uh, process. My mother, uh, reminded me that uh, I had uh, three children, so I should be taking better care of them and uh, making sure that uh, I live into my 70s or 80s or whatever. And uh, that was because I was uh, overweight. I had something like 30, 35 kilos, that's uh, 70, 75 pounds or something like that. So, uh, and then uh, I'm a lazy guy, to be honest. So, uh, having some roots in uh, biology, I decided that there must be a smarter way to lose that weight than counting calories and, and uh, counting what I eat and, and then just running around the block like a crazy man. So I decided I, I first start reading. I gave it a, a few weeks and then uh, do something which, which offers the, the possibility that I don't have to do that. I mean, counting and, and, and running. So uh, as a lazy guy, I started reading. Uh, it was during uh, Christmas holidays back in uh, 2013, I believe. And uh, I recognized that uh, there are a lot of uh, diets, which many call fat, fat diets. And uh, these offer uh, exactly what I was looking for back then. So um, I started out with something like the Atkins. So I went uh, almost zero plants, just some, some leaves and, uh, and some, some, some seeds on top of the leaves, I, I remember that time. So and I, and I ate all the meat I wanted, it, it was wonderful, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, you, I couldn't believe it as a biologist, it sounded uh, just uh, crazy. And then I uh, started losing weight uh, very fast. And uh, in uh, five, six months I lost uh, basically all, uh, all the excess, something like uh, 30 something kilos. I was not measuring my weight before, so I, I, I don't know where I started from. But uh, I lost at least 30 kilos, probably more. That's uh, 70 pounds, something like that, in, in five, six months. And uh, then I started, uh, then I continued reading. So I, I just continued to read. Uh, first I was reading blogs and then I was reading uh, books and then slowly but, but uh, surely I turned to uh, original research papers because I, I found out that uh, wh whenever you read uh, a book or, or a uh, blog post or a series of blog posts it it's closely resembles somebody else's opinion and it's, it's, it's not necessarily my opinion so I started uh, started to read uh, more and more uh, original papers and less and less books and, and blog posts and uh, finally I ended up with all these thousands of papers and uh, maybe I read uh, half of them, I, I'm not sure how, how many. Uh, all the abstracts of course because the, the, only after that I save a paper but uh, otherwise I read or quick read maybe half of them so getting close to 2000 maybe. 2000 papers yeah, in total. Two, yeah. And, uh, but it's not, it's not to brag, brag just, to, just to put a perspective on, on uh, how much I read. I read sometimes five studies a day, sometimes uh, yeah, five studies a week. Uh, it, yeah. it, it depends on my, my free time. That's quite a lot. I mean, I've, 
somewhere in that region, but I've lost track at this point. So yeah, I, I don't really count. Mm. I, I just see in, in the uh, in the application how many I, I have on file, mm. and uh, I just estimate how many I read. It's just a yeah. vague figure. I don't know. But the key thing is that you, like me originally, uh, funny enough, in my case, I went straight to pub, uh, PubMed and ResearchGate because I didn't even know what book to look for, for GGT and Elevated Ferritin. Mm. So I had to go straight to the research papers because there was no other route. But anyway, I digress. So reading all these research papers, you were following a problem-solving path, moving from where you started, which ended up giving you a high meat, high fat diet, losing 30 kilograms, that's huge. Uh, I lost 15 and I thought that was big, or 65 pounds that is for the American audience. Um, your journey continued deeper into the science, so what, where did you go next? Um, um, my interest back then was mainly about uh, diabetes, and I think actually it still is. So um, I started with the liver, and uh, a liver specific approach is still very common. Uh, among uh, endocrinologists, I think, uh, because um, uh, if, if you read some science, then you recognize that it's uh, not really a problem of clearing the glucose from your blood, but the problem, the, the major problem is that uh, uh, a diabetic keeps releasing, keeps producing uh, too much glucose by, by the liver. And uh, I, I recognized that uh, very early on, and then I, I tried, to f tried to find out uh, what, what what went wrong with the liver? I mean, what goes wrong with the liver uh, in terms of uh, producing uh, too, too, high, too, too much sugar, too much uh, glucose? And um, uh, then I recognized that uh, it's, it may not be a problem uh, within the liver, but uh, there, was, there was compelling evidence to show that the, the delivery of fat to the liver causes this state of, uh, of insulin resistance and, and uh, not listening to the, to the uh, signals of insulin, insulin signals to stop producing uh, glucose to the liver. And uh, I recognize that uh, fatty acids are being delivered even though, uh, e even in the fat state. So when you eat, how the body normally works, uh, you should stop releasing uh, the majority of the, the fatty acids from your adipose tissues and then you, at the same time you, you should stop uh, or greatly reduce both. Uh, you should uh, reduce uh, releasing glucose from your liver because you ate. Basically most people eat glucose, most people eat uh, fat and also protein. And uh, there is no need to, to catabolize uh, all the, the stored uh, glucose and, and fat. But what happens in, in diabetes is that uh, this catabolism uh, is uh, going on. And on. So uh, what you see that you, you you eat some glucose that goes into the body, and your liver puts at least as much on top. That's why you have high blood glucose. This was the first uh, basic uh, understanding. Uh, what I achieved uh, back, uh, I think, something like four more than four years ago. And then I realized that uh, okay, it may be uh, caused by the excess fat delivery from adipose tissues. And then uh, I turn. Uh, oh, I had some deter, de deterring to muscles, so, but that was very early on and I decided that okay, it's just a, a sufferer of, of this, these uh, happenings in the body. So, and Just to check on that, so oh, you began to explore what many people have is the buildup of fat in the muscles and how yeah. that contributes to muscular insulin resistance, yes. but absolutely as you say, that, that's a side dish really, yeah. it's not the core. I recognize that it must be uh, a secondary development because uh, it, it just doesn't make sense uh, that insulin resistance starts in your in your uh, muscles. Uh, I, I mean, there there may be some rare circumstances. I, I haven't actually. I stopped looking into that in details uh, many years ago, so I may be wrong, but uh, that's. Yeah, I think no. There, there are multiple studies which point that way. I agree. Uh, many of which you you sent me, <laughs> so I agree. <laughs> mm. And and uh, then uh, I spent the last uh, two three years uh, researching uh, adipose tissue biology, basically. And uh, I, I I always like to go back to very basics. I mean, uh, how it developed. I mean, evolutionarily. Uh, it's, it's, it may sound strange for some people, but uh, not all animals have adipose tissues. So it's a kind of a vertebrate 
uh, trait to have a separate uh, adipose tissue and then uh, as you uh, as we evolved uh, from from fish and amphibians uh, I think the most advanced uh, adipose tissues uh, uh, belong to uh, birds and, and mammals so uh, anything uh, beyond these models uh, I wouldn't really uh, yeah, I don't really like to be honest so if, if, if it comes from a fish model uh, okay forget about it or if it comes from an insect uh, drosophila um, a fruit fly uh, model uh, I don't really like it because they don't really have uh, uh, the, the uh, similar adipose tissues exactly and then, then you recognize that uh, adipose tissue is a very recent addition evolutionarily and uh, then it's it's kind of a little bit on top of the others it was added on top of the others and, and this is also uh, this also shows the hierarchy of uh, of the tissues that it was added on top later so it's kind of a little bit uh, organized on top of the others and then you recognize how important a, a uh, endocrine organ adipose tissue is so how many hormones it uh, secretes and how many of the fatty acids it releases or modified fats it releases have these signaling effects on the body and then uh, yeah, I think uh, half of my papers is on adipose tissue biology, so I could uh, go into really, really uh, deep uh, into this. But uh, uh, recently, uh, maybe one, one and a half years ago, I recognized that, uh, uh, okay, uh, adipose tissue stores a lot of fat, that's obesity. Obesity, obesity is related to, to insulin resistance, but there is a kind of a dis discrep discrepancy between the two. So sometimes very lean people, in fact I would say too lean people, are insulin resistant and uh, just the other way around, extremely obese people can be insulin sensitive. You, you see it very often that uh, these seven, eight hundred pounds uh, people, they, they can be insulin sensitive and a perfect uh, uh, non-fatty liver when they, they have for example a, a bariatric surgery and then the surgeon uh, praises them that uh, what a beautiful normal liver you have uh, at, at, at uh, 800 pounds of, of weight. Uh, how is that possible? So it was very interviewing. And the other end of the spectrum is uh, this uh, lipodystrophy, uh, when you have uh, no proper uh, masses of adipose tissue. So when you eat, your body cannot properly store it. So it goes to all the other places, uh, into your liver, for example. And I, I believe actually there are some possibly mouse models of lipodystrophy where when they simply um, insert some adipose tissue into the mouse they resolve the problem just by giving it someone else's which is interesting to, to prove, prove that even in a mouse experiment. It's amazing. Yeah and then, then, then you uh, just arrive to the place where you recognize all the different uh, kinds of adipose tissues because uh, basically almost all of your adipose tissues are different so it's not just one big uh, pool of fat but you have very different i mean metabolically very different and and, and uh, different from a signaling perspective uh, and, and uh, some is just mainly just there to protect uh, sensitive organs but but also they can exert uh, exert very uh, profound metabolic effects on, on organs perivascular fat for example around your your blood vessels uh, pericardial fat around your your heart and, and, and all these kind of fats and, and uh, they are very 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 active uh, metabolically speaking and, and as you say uh, Gabor said earlier the fat came late in our evolution and began to stack on top of our metabolic system but now you're saying there are many types of fat or almost species of fat that developed for different uh, functions I guess and they're extremely metabolically active so maybe if you work I just had a thought work from the kind of safest most generic benign fat back to the more interesting fats yeah I think um, generally speaking uh, fat below your waist is protective so if you have uh, some fat uh, on your buttocks and, and thighs uh, typically it's called uh, uh, in a bit of uh, Greek word gynoid uh, obesity that means uh, female type of uh, obesity because most females uh, have uh, or, or they are prone to developing uh, uh, some obesity around their, their legs and, 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 and buttocks that's that's very typical we could say and uh, then the, the, the other type is the, the so-called Android this is uh, again uh, or androgenic uh, when, when you have uh, male-like 
uh, fat deposition is typically goes into your stomach so you, you develop a big beer belly that that's also very typical and uh, and and uh, there are a lot of other types of uh, tissues uh, uh, how superficial uh, adipose tissue on on your stomach for example and or, or how deep it is uh, determines the, 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 the benign nature of, of this tissue. The more superficial, the better to, to store uh, excess fat. So they're kind of safe external storage depots that, yeah. as you said earlier, can actually protect you from diabetes yes. by safely storing excess energy. So after this um, tissue that's relatively safe, then we get into the visceral adipose tissue. Yeah and more in towards the organs and then you've got the, well, the intra-organal or, or the ectopic fat. So uh, that's where you're really pushing into storage forms that are... Yeah, I see it, I see it as a spectrum. So you have this superficial mm. subcutaneous fat also hopefully on your buttocks and, and thighs mm. then it's straight protective uh, and then, then you have this kind of neutral superficial uh, subcutaneous fat on your, on your belly and then as you as you are going deeper it, it gets more and more harmful so um, yeah visceral fat uh, is uh, very strongly uh, correlated with uh, with uh, with uh, diabetes insulin resistance and so on and so forth but to put it into a different perspective it's still better it's still a lot better to uh, develop uh, visceral obesity than uh, than, than uh, just uh, deposit all that fat in your liver for example and pancreas or any yeah. other organs, yeah. You know, all these other, uh, even more sensitive places. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a spectrum. Mm. There, is, uh, there is no clear-cut uh, threshold uh, between uh, these, uh, these depots. I mean, yeah, uh, d developing only subcutaneous uh, obesity beyond a certain threshold is also uh, detrimental because your, your, your joints will suffer and, and uh, uh, your, your cardiac output is compromised and all these kind of uh, mechanistic uh, issues. But it's not uh, coming from, from the insulin resistance of, of the body because your, your uh, excess, uh, huge excess depots are keeping you healthy basically, metabolically health, healthy. So if we take then the adipocytes, the adipose tissue as being a hugely important organ or spectrum of organs with many metabolically active fats being released from them, signaling molecules, talking to the liver, talking to the other organs, they're upstream from the liver insulin resistance problem and they're a big wheel. So what's driving the adipose tissue wheel? What's driving it to become dysfunctional? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question and I, I don't think I have a 100% uh, clear-cut answer what? to that one. <laughs> Hold on. Because I, I, yeah, I, 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 probably I had the Nobel Prize by, by now, if, if, <laughs> if I did, but... Uh, <laughs> well, you have excellent theories based on huge numbers of excellent papers, so if you can articulate the best shot of what's going on. So basically, um, how it works, uh, the mechanism, what, what we understand uh, of... Uh, how you, you can develop uh, metabolically benign obesity is that you, you add new fat cells continuously. Some people can add basically uh, infinite numbers of uh, new fat cells, even when they are uh, adults. Typically, most people add the new fat cells during childhood and, and adolescence, but uh, some, some new fat cells can be added later as well. But some people uh, don't have any cap on this. So they, they can become extremely obese and uh, still they add new fat cells. These new fat cells are always insulin sensitive. And these new, new insulin sensitive uh, fat cells keep um, saving them from, from metabolic disease. So they do not move down the spectrum of visceral or ectopic no. because they keep expanding. Yes, exactly. And I think that's called uh, hyperplasia for... Yes. Uh, yes. That's hyperplasia and when the opposite happens, if you are not able to add uh, new fat cells, that's called hypertrophy. So your existing fat cells balloon up mm. and when uh, these fat cells reach a certain size, something like 100 microns or, or, or this, this range, then uh, they become dysfunctional. Uh, mechanically, simply mechanically. So you don't need any fancy thing to, to make a fat cell uh, insulin resistance. You need just too, too much fat. Because uh, all cells have a, a, a supporting network within the cell called uh, the cytoskeleton. Basically the skeleton for the internal skeleton for, for the cell. And uh, uh, just imagine that a huge fat droplet keeps growing within the cell. 
and uh, it, it disrupts this uh, cytoskeleton. And uh, how, the, how, how insulin works in fat cells is that it signals uh, into the cell to recruit more glucose receptors, glucose uh, transporters to the cell membrane. And then these uh, transporters are being moved from internal membrane pools uh, to the cell membrane. And uh, even though this, uh, uh, this is not very important uh, uh, quantitatively, I mean, uh, fat cells take up maybe 5% of the glucose in the body, but it's extremely important uh, from, the, from a signaling perspective. So that's where uh, the, the body insulin sensitivity uh, lies. I mean, uh, the, the core of the body, body's insulin sensitivity is uh, that this process is working properly. So you can recruit these uh, GLUT4 uh, transporters to the cell membrane of fat cells. And when, when, when uh, fat just uh, disrupts this uh, cytoskeleton within the fat cell, it, it mechanistically blocks the recruitment of uh, the, the, the glucose transporters from the internal membrane pools to, to the cell membrane. And then basically the adipose, adipocyte signaling, which is so important for systemic signaling and insulin sensitivity, is broken because the cell size of the adipose yeah. has grown beyond its ability to internally signal. And that's, that's really fascinating stuff. And uh, the question probably next is, if that's just a mechanical thing, and we accept that people are different. Some can do hyperplasia, keep making more small, good signaling, uh, healthy ad adipocytes, and they're protected until they get to the point where that's limited and they begin to get swollen fat cells. That takes down the adipocyte signaling system, which takes down the whole organism, ultimately. But what would be the mechanisms of driving the adipocytes to become dysfunctional uh, for an average person who's at the threshold of hypertrophy? Yeah, first of all, I, I, I must add that uh, it's, it's not only about the, the size. First, that, that's the beginning mm. of, of insulin resistance uh, me mechanically. And then uh, these uh, overly enlarged fat cells start secreting uh, different uh, hormone different hormones, a different so-called adipo adipokine profile. Mm. And, and also uh, uh, they, they start secreting um, so-called uh, macrophage uh, chemo-attractant protein uh, so that they, they call in the immune system to, to solve this problem because this is, this is a problem in, in adipose tissue. We can't operate uh, normally anymore. Uh, please uh, do something. And then, then uh, these uh, macrophages come in and, and uh, take up an inflammatory uh, um, and profile. Then, and then if, if you measured them, but no one does, your IL-1 beta and your uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha and all these things in that state would be beginning to rise, but, uh, but they're not standard blood tests, so no one sees it. Yeah, mm. yeah, but, but that, that's, that's the, the, the second step, so it's very close to what you can actually measure in the blood, mm. because you cannot really measure, you have to take a biopsy from your, from your fat Hopefully, also from visceral fat, it's, it's very uh, clumsy, and and, and uh, uh, you don't really want to do that. And and but you, well, yeah, what, what you can do first of all from a from a blood test is uh, having a, a look at the, the adipose uh, specific inflammation, because that's very telling. And uh, what can make uh, what can make an adipose tissue non-responsive? I mean. Uh, in general, this, this inflammation is absolutely uh, necessary for proper expansion. So uh, to recruit new um, uh, immune cells and then, then to recruit new uh, pre-adipocytes so that that can be converted to, to uh, mature adipocytes, this inflammation is absolutely uh, fundamental. Uh, this is not the problem, but when, when this persists, when the, the acute inflammatory response becomes chronic, that's the real uh, problem. And uh, what can make a, 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 an adipose tissue chronically inflamed? I would say there is a very nice study showing that insulin, very high levels of insulin, can further uh, contribute this. And then uh, there is another uh, set of papers showing that uh, a hormone called uh, gut secreted hormone called GIP can do, it, do this alone even without uh, insulin, so it has uh, detrimental effects. If elevated, often elevated, uh, it has a similar effect on, on, uh, on adipo adipocytes. But, and that's GIP, I think it's glucose insulinotropic 
polypeptide. Glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. That's a, that's a secondary name actually to, to match the first name it was given because first it was given the, the glucose, oh no, the gastric inhibitory polypeptide and then they found out that uh, it has no uh, it had no uh, inhibitory effect on gastric emptying, so <laughs> they, they had to change the name, but they wanted to keep the abbreviation uh, GIP, so they, they came up with this weird uh, weirdo name of, uh, of uh, glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. Yeah, that's yes, the, that's, that's the official and So if we just dwell for a moment on that, that's the GIP. It's a hormone released from the gut, depending on what you eat, will affect how it's released and it signals to adipose tissue and you don't want it too high or too often or too chronically high. It signals to bones, it signals to adipose tissues, mm. but yeah, the first uh, action uh, that was recognized was signaling to the, to the pancreas, to beta cells and alpha cells. And uh, what it does is uh, it increases the insulin response so to, to blood glucose. Mm. Uh, actually, it can uh, double or triple the insulin response to, to blood glucose. And it also signals uh, the alpha cells to release uh, more glucagon.